Across. Order, Senator Watt, you will be in continuation, and I believe you have the call. Questions without notice, Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. I refer to the Minister's letter answering questions taken on notice in Senate Question Time yesterday in relation to the Earlhaven Nursing Home in Queensland, operated by People Care Proprietary Limited, which recently closed with over 70 elderly residents evacuated to other aged care facilities and a public hospital. The Minister's response today confirms that prior to the evacuation of residents, People Care had at least seven sanctions including for failing to provide residents with a safe environment and failing to provide adequate nutrition and hydration. And in addition, People Care had uh, been the subject of 22 complaints since 1 January 2018. With this history of sanctions and complaints, how is it that People Care was allowed to keep operating the Earlhaven Nursing Home, putting the health of over 70 older Australians at risk? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Watt, for the question. Um, quite simply, because uh, as sanctions are applied, which are a function of the quality system that we operate in this country, corrective action is taken to deal with the sanctions. Sanctions aren't necessarily a mortal process in the quality system. Uh, they are actually a mechanism by which uh, the, quality si the quality agency goes in. Uh, conducts reviews of the activities within a, within a service, uh, says to the service, you need to take corrective action. They go back, they assess the corrective action that's been taken, and once the corrective action has been taken to resolve the issues, the sanctions, the sanctions process is closed. Uh, and on each occasion, uh, in previous circumstances, that's exactly what happened. So, so the, the agency, the agency went in. Uh, they asked the, the the agency went in. Uh, corrective action was taken to resolve the issues, uh, and then uh, the sanctions were the sanctions process was completed. Now that's what happens in all circumstances where there's issues that are found in aged care facilities across Australia. That is actually how a quality system works, and so. Uh, it's, it's quite it, it, order. The process is uh, an inspection is undertaken, <laughs> defects or faults are found, corrective action is taken uh, by the facility under the supervision and direction of the uh, quality agency, uh, and once those uh, processes are completed, the sanctions process is closed, and that's happened, as you've noted, on a number of occasions. Senator, what a supplementary question? Is the minister aware that the operation of the Earlhaven nursing home had been subcontracted to a company called Help Street, whose owner was the subject of an Australian Securities and Investment Commission ban for unpaid debts? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thanks, Senator, for the supplementary question. Uh, as the events of the 11th of July unfolded, uh, I did become aware of those matters. I wasn't uh, previously aware of those issues that you've raised with respect to, uh, with respect to the um, subcontracting arrangements and also the directors who were involved. Uh, and in fact, that's one of the reasons that I've in instigated the inquiry that I had, because it's those sorts of issues, it's those sorts of reach issues through subcontracting processes that that I want to get the answers to, because as we have all agreed in the chamber, uh, we want to prevent these sorts of things occurring. Uh, and so, uh, Mr. President, uh, I wasn't aware, and I don't think anyone was necessarily aware of all of the details that uh, uh, Mr. Senator Watt. Uh, Order, Senator Colbeck. Time's expired. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Given the history of sanctions, complaints, and corporate wrongdoing, why did this Liberal National Government allow residents of Earlhaven Nursing Home to be put at risk in this way? Senator Colbeck. Well, thanks, Mr. President. Senator, I completely reject the premise of your question. Because 
what you're trying to do in this circumstance what, what you're trying to do in this circumstances and actually you build your cat build the cat yourself last night order, you, you build the cat on this last Senator, night. Senator Cormann on a point of order. Th th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I mean, the level of I mean, interjections are always disorderly. The level of interjection is uh, completely and utterly unacceptable. Uh, a question is asked, and it's immediately followed by a barrage of interjection, preventing uh, the minister from answering the question. Clearly, the senator is not interested in the answer; he's just interested in political you're points. Right. You're right, Senator Wong, on a po uh, on, on the, the point, point of order. order uh, whilst uh, you know, Senator Watt is doing his best, he's certainly nowhere near Senator uh, Doug Cameron on the barrage yet. So I think Senator Cormann is demonstrating his sensitivity over a minister who's struggling. I'm, I'm not sure if. With all due respect to our former colleague, that's the best example. The interjections are always disorderly. I had just called the senator to order. I call Senator Colbeck to continue his answer. Thanks, Mr. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, the thing that concerns me about where Labor and Senator Watt are trying to go with this issue right now is that they're trying to make it about something that it wasn't. Order. They're trying to go to something where it, about what it wasn't. They're suggesting, they're trying to suggest Order that people on my knew left. in advance what might happen at Earl Haven. Those terrible circumstances that happened at Earl Haven on the 11th of July. But Senator Watt actually belled the cat himself last night in his adjournment speech when he said, and I quote, "The paramedics, people from the Gold Coast, and every single Order. person who got involved Senator in Colbeck. this emergency." Senator Colbeck, time for the effort. answer has expired. Senator Colbeck. Order. Senator Colbeck, Senator Wong, Sen I will Senator Wong, Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the government is getting on with the job of securing our nation through our defence engagement in the Pacific, please? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Askew for that question. And I'd also note uh, how much I enjoy working with her on defence uh, research and academic uh, work in Tasmania. So thank you. Australia does have a long-standing defence relationship with the Pacific Island nations. They are neighbours and they are our friends. This is because Australia and the Pacific Island countries recognise that a stable, secure and prosperous region is in all of our interests. So over many years, we have made an enduring contribution for the security of the region through our defence cooperation. This contribution is clearly seen in the Pacific Maritime Security Program. This program, which builds on the success of the Pacific Island Boat Program, has three main parts. Mr. President, it includes new patrol boats, 21 across the Pacific and Timor-Leste. It includes a program of region-wide aerial surveillance and it includes enhancements to the way the region works together through support for the Forum Fishing Agency. This program will help Pacific Island nations to protect their own sovereignty. By being better positioned to provide for their own security, they will be able to protect their natural resources and protect their prosperity. The Defence Cooperation Program has broad, broadly provides training and support to the security and defence forces in the region by engaging with our partners in the region. Now, as part of the Pacific Step Up, Defence is doing even more in the region. We are increasing our maritime and land uh, presence to conduct training activities with Pacific Island military and security forces. We are convening an annual Joint Heads of Pacific Security event here in Australia, reinforcing alumni networks in the security sector and also, most importantly, uh, expanding sporting engagements which I know my colleague will uh, greatly appreciate. Order on my left. Hmm. Senator Askew, a supplementary question. Could the minister update the Senate on the defence relationship with Papua New Guinea? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Australia and <coughs> Papua New Guinea are close neighbours and we are even closer friends. Australia's commitment to this relationship is shown through the strength of our defence cooperation program. The Australia Papua New Guinea Defence Cooperation Program is our largest globally, standing at more than $40 million per annum. Under this program, the Australian Defence Force and Papua New Guinea Order. Defence Force conduct a significant program of activities together. These include exercises and operations. 
mentoring and training, maritime engagement, capability development, infrastructure development and also more general capacity building. Yesterday, I was greatly honoured to engage with my counterpart from Papua New Guinea, the Honourable Saki Saloma, their Minister for Defence. Minister Saloma and I discussed how we can drive greater defence cooperation together as part of the new comprehensive strategic and economic partnership agreed by both of our Prime Ministers yesterday. Senator ask you a final you. supplementary question. Could the Minister expand on the new package of defence initiatives? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Senator Askew, and thank you, Mr President. Yes, I can. And what we've agreed to celebrate the 40th anniversary of our defence cooperation program, Australia will provide a new package of initiatives to Papua New Guinea. This package is valued at $20 million and will continue to build on the breadth and depth of our enduring defence partnership. The initiatives will focus on building a minimum sustainable PNG capability. There will be four main components to this assistance. Firstly, we have committed to supporting PNG to build a balanced and sustainable uh, aviation capability. Secondly, we have committed to an expanded maritime security partnership. And thirdly, we have committed to building an infrastructure investment program. And fourthly, we will support PNG's vision to build a force for the future. Mr President, it is indeed fitting that in the 40th year of our defence cooperation that we elevate our deep and enduring partnership Order. together. Senator Reynolds. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. In the Secretary of the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet's report in re relation to the application of the Statement of Ministerial Standards against former Ministers Pine and Bishop, Mr Parkinson states that the former Minister for Foreign Affairs, Ms Bishop, and I quote, did not have any contact with Palladium in the five years that she was Minister for Foreign Affairs. A video filmed in Ms Bishop's then office titled, Australia's Foreign Minister Julie Bishop commends shared values and Palladium's business partnership platform, was posted on the 9th of June 2017 on the Facebook page, Palladium, make it happen. What action has the Prime Minister or his office taken to verify the claim that Ms Bishop did not have any contact with Palladium in the five years that she was Minister for Foreign Affairs, given this latest revelation? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. Uh, the Prime Minister is satisfied, uh, based on the advice from Dr Parkinson, that there was no breach of ministerial stand standards. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Given these latest revelations, how can the findings of Mr. Parkinson's report stand? How can the findings of Mr. Parkinson's report stand? Senator Cole. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the Prime Minister is satisfied, uh, based on the advice from Dr. Parkinson, uh, that uh, there was no breach of the statement of ministerial standards. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I refer to reports that new LNP Senator Jared Rennick today urged any of his colleagues who are close friends with Christopher That's Pine or Julie, Order. or Julie Bishop to tell them to step down from their jobs because it's an embarrassment for the government. Yep. Is Senator Rennick correct? A breath of fresh air. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Senator Rennick is, of course, uh, another one of those great Liberal National Party senators from the great state of Queensland, and we're very pleased to have him on board as part of our team. And uh, let, me, let, me, let me say, uh, in relation to the other parts of the question, that I refer the Honourable Senator to my previous answers. Order. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. After the arrest of four French journalists in Queensland yesterday, has the minister or her department been in contact with the French ambassador or attempted to assist the journalists concerned? Furthermore, what diplomatic steps would the Australian government take if an Australian journalist was arrested in similar circumstances in France or perhaps Hong Kong? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Hanson Young for her question. Yesterday, on the 22nd of July, the Queensland Police Service arrested seven people following protest activity at a port facility near Bowen. The Queensland Police Service have said that the seven are due to appear in the Bowen Magistrates Court on the 3rd of September this year. Uh, any inquiries or queries relating to the circumstances of the arrest, of course, Mr. President, would be appropriately referred to the Queensland Police Service. 
and any inquiries regarding consular support which would be extended to French nationals are ones which would be addressed by the Embassy of France. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, further question for the minister: How will the government respond to the concerns of the international community regarding Australia's press freedoms after the heavy-handed heavy arrest of these four journalists? And could you please answer the remainder of my first question: What would you do if it was an Australian journalist in France? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. As Australia does, appropriate consular support is extended to Australian citizens when they are travelling overseas in a broad range of circumstances. That is a responsibility of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and uh, our consular services division takes very seriously. Uh, in relation to uh, the matters of the arrest, uh, Mr President, they relate I presume to an ongoing investigation being carried out or an ongoing inquiry being carried out by the Queensland Police Service, and I don't intend to comment on those details. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Australia's international reputation has been called into question after the arrest of these four French journalists on the back of raids of our national broadcaster and raids on individual journalists. What will the government do to restore the faith of the Australian citizens and the international community of our press freedoms. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. As I said uh, in recent weeks when I spoke at a conference on these matters uh, in London, uh, the Australian government has asked what is a very senior parliamentary committee, the Parliamentary Committee on Intelligence and Security, to conduct an inquiry into how law enforcement and intelligence powers do interact with protections for journalists and for press freedom to ensure that we do strike the right balance. The Australian government has also directly invited media organisations to provide direct submissions to government and engaged with those organisations uh, prior to this, of course, on those key issues of concern to them. And the government is looking forward to working with them and continuing what is a constructive dialogue over the coming months. We are committed to ensuring that in our democracy we strike the right balance the important right balance between a free press and keeping Australians safe, two fundamental tenets of our democracy which Australians expect us to observe. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture. Can the Minister please outline to the Senate how the Liberal and Nationals government is getting on with the job of supporting our farmers and regional communities through the drought? The Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator McMahon, uh, for your question. I know you are very passionate about strong, prosperous regions, particularly for the Northern Territory. From day one, the Liberal National Government has backed our farmers, experiencing drought now and into the future. Our government believes in the productive capacity of our primary producers and of the potential of rural and regional Australia and the seven million Australians that live there because our government knows that when our regions are strong, so too is our nation. That's why we've invested more than $7 billion in our drought response, which delivers ongoing, immediate and long-term support to our producers and their communities, including $266 million to provided to over 11,000 farmers on farm household allowance, $40 million in additional farm household allowance lump sum payments to about nearly 6,500 farmers, $77 million invested in the Rural Financial Counselling Service, helping 4,000 farming businesses, $35 million to support more than 10,000 households in drought areas, delivering cash and vouchers uh, from local charities, $131 million for the Drought Communities Program to deliver local infrastructure and drought relief projects, $50 million for on-farm water infrastructure, $2.7 million for localised weather guides, $72 million on special drought round of the National Water Infrastructure Fund, and I could go on. Our government has always committed to helping our farmers in recovery after drought and allowing our farmers and communities to focus on the future. The Future Fund as we've been, is a long-term investment in the drought resilience that our communities need. Uh, need. It is now up to our chamber here to show they're on, also on the side of our farmers. This week, as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, we've seen one small step for the Labor Party. It's time to take the great leap and support our farmers affected by drought. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Order. What proactive measures is this government taking to secure the long-term productivity and profitability of our farmers into the future. Senator McKenzie. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Drought is and has been and will always be a con constant factor in Australian agriculture. The establishment of the Future Drought Fund will provide a new, secure and predictable funding stream for drought resilience into the future. The government intends to grow the fund until it reaches $5 billion, while at the same time drawing down $100 million per year from July next year to build drought resilience across Australia. This will support R&D and innovation, infrastructure projects and deliver improved environmental and natural resource management to enhance agricultural practices. From the stump jump plough to precision uh, direct drill cropping, our farmers have always led the world in innovation, and this will ensure the next innovation comes sooner. Our fund demonstrates government's commitment to supporting farmers and communities to prepare for the inevitable future droughts. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. What are the risks to the confidence of the agriculture sector and regional communities should the government's drought measures not be supported? Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, last week I travelled to Dubbo with the Prime Minister to attend the Bush Summit hosted by the Daily Telegraph. And it was an excellent event that provided all attendees with an important understanding of the issues facing our drought-affected communities now, but also what is going to be needed to recover. To prepare now for the next drought was a constant theme of the day. In Dubbo, the lead of the opposition promised to stop playing games on drought. Drought has already cost our economy $12 million, and it won't be long before the national impact of the drought will be felt by all, even in Brunswick and Richmond. Already, wool production and sheep numbers have hit 100-year lows, and our horticultural sector is concerned about its ability to plant and harvest a number of crops. And it is likely that without spring rain, our grain production will take a huge hit. This drought will have significant impact on Australia's bottom line for some years to come. The Liberal and Nationals are on the side of the farmers. Regional Australia made that clear on May 18. It's now time to deliver. Order. Senator Gallagher. Mr President, uh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Senator Cormann, yesterday you ruled out any changes to the legislated superannuation guarantee, despite seven members of the government openly campaigning for them. Minister, do you stand by the answer you gave yesterday? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Yes. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you. Today there are reports in News Limited Press that a further two government members, including former Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce, have joined the anti-super camp and are challenging the increase to the superannuation guarantee. Senator Pat Patterson even directly contradicted government policy, despite your slapdown, immediately after question time yesterday. Minister, can you guarantee that this group will not be successful in their campaign against super? Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, Mr President. Well, firstly, I completely reject the uh, premise and, uh, of the question and the characterisation of the question. Uh, secondly, the government's policy uh, has not changed, as uh, the Prime Minister, the Treasurer and myself have now consistently stated. Uh, the, in fact, the policy is reflected in legislation. But let me, let me point uh, out to the Senate that I mean, the question really is, what has happened to Labor's policy, who went to the last election proposing to increase taxes on Australians' retirement savings by more than $30 billion? I mean, Bill Shorten was preparing to put his hands into the pockets of Australians who have worked hard, who are saving for their retirement. And of, course, and of course, we don't know what Labor's position is in relation to that $30 billion tax hike. I mean, does uh, Mr Albanese still support the shortened position of higher taxes on superannuation? We went to the last election making very clear commitments. Uh, we stand by the commitments we made before the election. Our government's policy hasn't changed. Well, Order. Senator oh, Cormann, oh, time oh, for oh, the answer oh. has expired. Like Senator Cormann and Senator Wong. Senator Cormann and Senator Wong. I order Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, with the open revolt and division on full display by government members, along with the Liberals' long record of opposition to superannuation, how can Australians trust the Morrison government? 
to protect their retirement incomes. Senator Cormann. Much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the Liberal National Party team is, of course, a very strong and united team, which went with a which went with a clear agenda to the last election to build a stronger economy, create more jobs, and indeed ensure uh, that Australians are safe and secure. Can be safe and secure. If only there was a bit more division on the Labor side when it comes to protecting people's superannuation savings. If only there was a bit more division on the Labor side. If, if, the, if only there was a bit less unity on the Labor side behind this proposition that there should be higher taxes on everyone that moves across Australia. I mean, the truth is, if Labor had been successful at the last election, uh, Australians saving for their retirement would be $30 billion worse off right now. Right now. And, uh, and of course, it's to the great relief of uh, Australians saving for their retirement right around Australia that the Labor Party was unsuccessful, that we have been successful because, of course, taxes across Australia will be lower as a result, the economy will be stronger and, indeed, Australians will be uh, safer and more secure. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment. Will the minister outline to the Senate how the government is getting on with the job of delivering its plan to back Australian tourism and jobs and how this creates opportunities for Australians? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Chandler for her question and congratulate her on her first question. And, uh, indeed, I know that uh, all senators, I'm sure, are looking forward to an outstanding first speech later this afternoon and wish her well for that. Uh, and can I thank her for her first question, particularly focusing on the tourism sector, an industry so important to Senator Chandler's home state of Tasmania, as it is, as it is of course, right across Australia. Last Wednesday, the National Visitor Survey was released, and it showed that Australians took some 109 million over overnight trips and spent a record $75 billion over the last year, up some 14 per cent on the previous year. Australians are, in increasing numbers, choosing to holiday at home, and the number indeed of overnight trips to the state of Tasmania, I'm pleased to say, increased by some 12 per cent over that time horizon as well as part of the booming tourism industry we're seeing in Tasmania. Importantly, international tourism is also growing strongly, with international spending hitting some $44.3 billion. These are tourists, domestic and international, coming and spending up in accommodation providers, in restaurants, in attractions, right across our regional towns and cities, and in doing so creating and underpinning vast amounts of employment. Indeed, around one in 13 Australian jobs relates to our tourism industry, uh, and that's a testimony to the fact that so many hard-working tourism operators show initiative and drive and entrepreneurship across regional Australia. I'm delighted to say that these figures show that we have now met and surpassed the Tourism 2020 target that our government has been striving towards. We've done so ahead of time, and I acknowledge the hard work and effort of the tourism industry right around Australia, the state, territory and regional tourism partners who work collaboratively with Tourism Australia, and thank all of those partners for the efforts in getting us to this point where our tourism industry is supporting and underpinning so many jobs and so many small businesses Order. right around Australia. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, what is the coalition doing to ensure a strong tourism sector into the future? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, in addition to our ongoing record support for Tourism Australia and their marketing efforts, uh, we also are continuing to fund major investment in tourism infrastructure. In the budget this year, we announced a $50 million tourism icons package, a package that's going to deliver benefits to regions such as the Freycinet in Tasmania. And I'm delighted that Senator Dunningham, Senator Dunningham, as the Assistant Minister for Regional Tourism, will be playing a key role in the delivery of those regional tourism icons. We'll also see investment as a government in the Shipwreck Coast, in Kakadu National Park, in Jabiru Township, and continue, continued our commitment to make sure that a tourism component is a dedicated element of the Building Better Regions Fund to provide targeted support in small tourism grants right around regional Australia. We also, in our election campaign, committed $40 million to fund and establish and grow Indigenous tourism as part of our government's commitment to make sure that visitors to Australia get an Order. authentic Senator Indigenous Birmingham. tourism Time experience as expired. part of their visit. Senator Chandler, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Are there particular regional benefits being realised thanks to the Coalition's tourism policies? If so, what are they? Senator Birmingham. 
Mr President, regional tourism is such a core part of our tourism success. 43 cents in every tourism dollar that's spent is spent in Australia's regions. Across each and every state and territory, we see Australians touring around, international visitors and, in large amounts, spending those dollars in those regional towns and communities. Critically, a big part of that as well are older Australians and older visitors. Over 65s uh, account for 16 per cent of all overnight travel, with 16.9 million trips in the year ending March 2019. These Australians, as well as Australians who are receiving tax cuts from the coalition government at present, will have more that they can invest and spend in regional tourism and in travelling around our country and supporting and underpinning those jobs far more than they would have had if those opposite, of course, had come along with their tax slugs on retirees and their tax slugs on people's savings, all of which would have hurt our economy and suppressed our tourism industry, which instead is growing strongly Order. thanks to Liberal national Birmingham. policies. Senator Griff. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to Senator Canavan, representing Senator Cash, the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business. In the latest budget, the government committed about $350 million over five years to support 80,000 new apprentices in areas of skills shortages. Last week, Senator Cash told a VIC conference she was passionate about lifting the profile of vocational education. What is the government's plan to support these young apprentices, many of whom are school leavers, to ensure that they stick with their training all the way and actually emerge with a qualification? The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Canavan. Well, thank you very much, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Griff, for that uh, very relevant question. Uh, Senator Griff, you are correct that the government is providing significant support to help young Australians uh, get into apprentice apprenticeships. Um, it is. A, a significant challenge now at the moment in our economy to do so. Uh, while apprenticeship numbers have been down for some time, youth unemployment is also down over the past few years, and the government is investing to help support uh, new apprenticeships through our $60 million investment in the Australian Apprenticeship Wage Subsidy Trial. That builds also on other initiatives the government already has in place, which include an additional identified skills shortage payment of $156 million and the Incentives for Australian Apprenticeships program of $44 million as well. Now, these are new initiatives that build on also the Skilling Australians Fund uh, that was uh, established in the last couple of years as well. Um, uh, at the moment, uh, Mr President, the, uh, the, the government has announced a request for tender process associated with the Australian Apprenticeship Support Network. Uh, that was announced in June by Minister Andrews. Uh, that process will ultimately lead to an RFT which does outline the kind of services and support that uh, service providers would provide to help apprenticeships not just fill those positions but also, of course, make sure they have the requisite training and, as uh, the senator outlined, make sure they uh, continue in the apprenticeship to ultimately get support. Um, uh, that, of course, that the process is being developed with service providers and uh, those interested in this space. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Two years ago, we negotiated the implementation of a national mentoring program to support apprentices through their first two years, and that was uh, via the then Minister, Minister Birmingham. Um, this program assisted over 17,000 apprentices from almost 8,000 employers. And in my home state of South Australia, the automotive industry saw retention rates jump from 50 to over 90 per cent. Funding ends this year. Will government commit to continuing this program? Order. Senator Griff, Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. President, um, uh, and, and Mr. President, the, the government uh, is proud of the performance of the industry specialist mentoring program that Senator Griff mentioned in his question. It was established in 2017. It was always a time-limited project program due to finish or has finished on the 30th of June this year. It has assisted, in my notes, uh, Mr. President, has assisted 30,000 uh, apprenticeships. Uh, uh, or apprentices, um, which is a, a great outcome. Those, this program provides in training support uh, and mentoring in particular uh, to help apprenticeships stay in their program. Um, the, the, while the program has ended, um, uh, the government intends to ensure that going forward all Australian apprenticeship support network contracts will require providers to facilitate mentoring as part of their in-training support, so it will be taken into an existing program. Uh, the government recognises the important value mentoring has to supporting young Australians through their apprenticeship. This is, of course, in addition to uh, many of the other investments I mentioned, over $500 million in skills, Order. our skills Senator package Canavan. and $3 Time million for the investment in vocational has expired. education. Senator Griff, final supplementary question. Okay. 
the actual program itself still runs even whilst it, it, it expired effectively mid-year, it still actually runs till the end of this year, will government commit whilst um, you're putting in place a process for mentoring to be taken over by other programs, will you commit to extending this program until um, there is full continuation? Senator Canavan. Mr President, um, Mr. President, I am informed that uh, from um, the Minister's office uh, today that the, the intention is to have uh, those mentoring arrangements, those mentoring funding arrangements in place by the end of the year. Uh, the, as you have said, the mentoring still continues even though the program has closed. Um, participants are still involved in that and the government will make sure we continue to support mentoring uh, through our various programs. Senator Green. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. I refer to reports that the Liberal National Government is targeting Townsville flood victims as part of its robo-debt program. When was the quarantining of Townsville flood victims from Centrelink's welfare debt recovery scheme lifted? Why was this decision made? Who made the decision? And if not the Minister, when did the Minister first become aware? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, and I thank the Senator for her question. Um, my understanding is that there has been no debt recovery in the Townsville area, recognising the fact that Townsville is still being impacted on, uh, on their recovery from the floods that so devastated the community um, a number uh, of months ago. Uh, so um, I can confirm that there has been no debt recovery um, undertaken in the Townsville area. Senator Green, a supplementary question. Townsville flood victims are displaced from their homes have had property and records destroyed and are in, in the process of fighting for compensation from insurance companies and are suffering the mental stress of unprecedented levels of flooding. Why is the Liberal National Government subjecting those who are still fighting to recover from the unprecedented levels of flooding to its robo-debt program as reported <laughs> in these reports? Senator Rustin. Well, look, thank you very much, uh, Senator, for your follow-up question. Um, and I refer to my answer to the previous question, and that is that no debt recovery has occurred in, uh, in Townsville. Um, and, but if there are any particular instances that the Senator is aware of where somebody who has been impacted on these absolutely devastating events uh, in Townsville, where we saw people displaced from their homes and, and extreme amounts of damage um, as a result of the floods that happened earlier this year, I would be more than happy to take on um, any information. Obviously, I'm not prepared to discuss specifics in this chamber of individual cases, but I would be more than happy to take on any individual issues that you believe have occurred, because to the best of my knowledge, there has been no debt recovery uh, commenced in no, Townsville. No, she's answered that. Order. Order. Senator Green, a final supplementary question. Townsville Mayor Jenny Hill has said, and I quote, I urge the federal government to review the recommencement date of the recovery of these debts because there could be a very Order real right. human impact of a community that is already hurting. Will the minister listen to Ms Hill's plea and agree to not recommence the quarantine of the robo-debt recovery action until the people of Townsville are back on their feet? Senator Rustin. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much, and I thank the senator for a further follow-up question. Um, I, I, I think I actually have already answered your question, but just to reinforce to this chamber that this government has no intention of commencing debt recovery on people in Townsville who have been significantly impacted on the uh, the no. events of earlier this Order. year. And I can also, um, if, if the, the others on the other side would like to listen to what I've got to say, they may actually get the answer to their question. Order on my uh, left. And, and I would say to, uh, to the senator who has asked the question that if the mayor of Townsville would like to raise any issues with me, I am absolutely welcome. Would welcome her phone call if she believes that anybody has been adversely impacted in Townsville as a result of the actions of the department for which I am responsible. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to also to the minister for families and social services. Can the minister update the Senate on how the government is getting on with the job of delivering better outcomes through the cashless debit card trials across Australia, including in my home state of Western Australia? 
The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and I thank uh, Senator Brockman for his question and his, uh, his strong interest and belief in uh, a sustainable and fair uh, system for all Australians. Um, and we also believe on this side of the chamber that not only is a sustainable welfare system important, but also one that helps the people who rely on it. And that's why this government rolled out the cash debit card trials across four sites across Australia. Um, but we rolled them out into sites where the communities has actually volunteered and put themselves forward and asked for this particular trial to occur because they believed that there was an opportunity to make real change in their communities. And these communities are reporting to us exceptionally positive results from these trials. Last month, I had the pleasure of being able to attend the goldfields in Senator Brockman's home state of Western Australia. And I learnt firsthand from a number of people in the community, whether it be people in the business community, um, police, health workers, local business owners, about the impact that the card had had in their communities. And there was one clear and strong and uniform response that people told me the card was making a difference, the streets in their towns were quieter and they felt safer. Uh, the police said to me that call-outs um, had reduced significantly from every night of the week to maybe only once a fortnight. There was a significant decrease in the amount of incidents of being reported of domestic violence uh, and, and mental health. Uh, and there were a significant number of, of presentations less that were presenting to our emergency services. But the story that I'd really like to quickly share with you is a young girl by the name of Nicole. Nicole's on a disability services pension, and she was the strongest opponent of the rollout of the CD. See, she was all over social media saying how terrible it was going to be. I'd like to tell you, Nicole told me she's just bought a car, and she credits the fact that she was able to buy a car on the cashless debit card because she said if she hadn't had the cashless debit card, she never would have been Order. able to do so. Senator, Rustin. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Minister. And, and I know the cashless debit card is making a real difference in these communities because I've, I've heard that directly from them myself, including from various local government authorities in the uh, Goldfields area. Uh, have any evaluations or reviews been done? And if so, what are the findings? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator Brockman. There have been over a dozen pieces of research done into the trials of the cashless debit card and income management programs that exist around Australia. Most recently, the baseline report into the goldfields um, has come back with um, some particular findings. And the key ones that have come out of this are a decrease in drug and alcohol issues, a decrease in crime and violence and antisocial behaviour, an improvement in child health and wellbeing, improved financial management by those on the card, and ongoing and even strengthening community support for the card. But these findings aren't new. These are the findings that we have from previous research seen. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, we had an independent evaluation that came out and said that considerable positive impact of the card. But the consistent themes that come out across the whole, the, the, all the research are improved child wellbeing, reductions in drug and alcohol use and gambling, and improvements in financial literacy and financial management. Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, what changes are you making to the cashless debit card? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Senator Brockman. Um, the fundamental changes that have, have occurred with the cashless debit card um, are about making it easier and more streamlined for people who um, are on the cashless debit card or other income management systems so that when they actually use the card, it's much more simple. We've been working with the banks around Australia to make sure that FPOS machines and the, the maximum amount of locations are able to use the card. We've also been working with major retailers to make sure that their FPOS is connected with their point of sale um, systems so that the card is, uh, operates no different from any other debit or credit card that anybody in this chamber would have. So, uh, that is why we believe that the continuation of the trial sites across Australia, as announced on 25 March this year, is tremendously important, because we believe the continued investment in technology will make this program better, as we believe investments in technologies will make the lives better of all Australians as they interface with their government. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Environment Minister, Senator Birmingham. Um, last week, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority released a position statement recognising that climate change is the greatest threat to the Great Barrier Reef. 
It says, and I quote, only the strongest and fastest possible actions to decrease global greenhouse gas emissions will reduce the risks and limit the impacts of climate change to the reef. It also said Order. there is an urgent and critical need to accelerate actions to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions and that that must happen in parallel with resilience building actions. Are you going to listen to the pleas from your own agency for genuine swift action on climate to protect the reef or are you just going to cut their funding again or give it to some other body to do the job? The minister representing the Minister for Environment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Waters for her question, uh, although not for some of the inaccuracies in uh, some of the statements that she made. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Senator Waters is uh, quite incorrect when it comes to funding in relation to the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, uh, this government has proudly provided uh, record levels of funding uh, to support the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, to ensure its resilience, to invest in its future, uh, and to do that in partnership where we can uh, with the Queensland government and other authorities. Uh, this government also uh, is proud of the fact that we continue to be, as a nation, uh, on track to meet and exceed uh, our 2020 emissions reduction targets, uh, and we're confident that we uh, will meet uh, and we hope exceed the 2030 emissions reductions targets that Australia has committed to uh, as part of the global effort. Uh, it's often mistaken uh, or overlooked when the Greens ask questions on these topics uh, that addressing climate change issues, of course, requires a concerted global effort. Australia is but one nation uh, in relation to that. Uh, we, however, are one nation that can be proud of our record of meeting and exceeding uh, the commitments that we made, and we can be proud of the fact that we will continue where we make commitments to meet and exceed uh, those targets. Uh, indeed, our work and the, uh, the work in terms of particularly Australia's emissions per capita and emissions intensity across our economy are at the lowest level in 29 years as a result uh, of a range of policy efforts that have been made, uh, and that contributes towards Australia's efforts in terms of meeting our overall emissions reductions targets. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Yeah, thanks, President. That didn't really address the first question, but you know, it wouldn't be the first time. Um, the reef narrowly avoided World Heritage in Danger listing in 2015, and this is up for reconsideration by the World Heritage Committee next year. Um, and we just saw one of the world's most respected naturalists, Sir David Attenborough, describe Australia's failure to act on climate as extraordinary. What are you going to do to take decisive climate action to protect the reef and start rebuilding our international reputation? Good Order. question. Senator Birmingham. Oh, oh, Mr President, I again point out to Senator Waters that when it comes to decisive climate action, uh, our government plays its role in making commitments on behalf of our nation as one nation amongst many in the world. Uh, and our commitments and our actions uh, are those of just one, and in relation to climate action, Australia cannot address this issue in isolation. We do it in partnership through the Paris Agreement, and we will, we will meet the targets that we've made in the Paris Agreement, which are significant targets in terms of reduction by between 26 to 28 per cent in relation to Australia's emissions targets. In relation to protecting the reef, what we do is we invest record sums in terms of building the reef's resilience. Uh, we address issues in addition to those climate change issues that we do work on globally through the Paris Agreement, uh, and we work instead on the resilience issues around matters such as soil runoff and emissions that you get uh, in other ways in terms of the nutrients that flow into the reef that can be of harm, and addressing those increases its resilience to a range of Order. threats, Senator including Birmingham, those related to climate expired. change. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thanks very much, President. Great Barrier Reef tourism generates uh, 64,000 jobs and more than $6 billion a year. And we just finally saw the Association of Marine Park Tourism Operators call for a rapid phase-out of fossil fuels and a transition to clean energy. This is the tourism industry speaking out, begging for action. What are you going to do to protect the tourism industry on the Great Barrier Reef? Order. Order. I need order. All at the rear of the chamber, order. I need to hear the question. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. As the tourism industry well knows, as, as valued partners through the Reef 2050 Long Term Sustainability Plan, we work with the tourism industry as we work with the Queensland Government, as we work with traditional owners, industry scientists, farmers, uh, the entire range of partners necessary uh, to build and sustain resilience in the reef and uh, to ensure its long term health, 
uh, as well as to make sure that we deliver, deliver on our policy commitments in relation to climate change and emissions reduction. But I tell you what we don't do, which you do when it comes to the tourism industry. We don't talk down their greatest asset. We don't tell people, don't bother about coming. We make sure that people Order. understand that what we do as a government, what we are seeking to do is preserve that asset, ensure that asset is there for future generations to visit, not scare them away as the Greens do. The Australian Greens are the greatest threat to the tourism industry in Queensland for the disgraceful way in which they try to scare visitors away, talk down a reef that Order. is well worth Senator visiting Birmingham, and be well worth for visiting answer. for many Has generations. Expired. Senator Wong. Thank you. My question is also to the Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. And I refer to reports that the now Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Mr Angus Taylor, met with the then Minister for the Environment, Mr Frydenberg's office and departmental officials in 2017 about a compliance action relating to his private land holdings. Can the minister confirm a company in which Mr Taylor has an interest, Jamland Proprietary Limited, is now being investigated by the Department of Environment and Energy in relation to the alleged illegal land clearing of critically endangered grasslands? The minister representing the Minister of the Environment, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr President. Uh, I'm aware in terms of the media reports of these matters that, uh, that I saw some time ago. Uh, well, Senator Wong, you're referring to something that just happened in the House. Uh, Mr President, uh, I'm aware of prior media reports in relation to these matters. Uh, I'm aware that, uh, uh, that uh, responses were given at the time, uh, that general representations in relation to constituent matters uh, had been made uh, on, uh, on this matter. Uh, beyond that, if there are additional details, I will take the question on notice and bring them back to the chamber. Senator Wong, supplementary question. Order. Can the minister confirm? Can the minister confirm that an officer from the compliance unit examining the alleged illegal land clearing by Jamland Proprietary Limited was present at the meeting which Mr. Taylor attended with departmental officials and Mr. Frydenberg's office on the 20th of March, 2017? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, I don't have a briefing that goes to any specific meetings on the 20th of March 2017. I'll take the question on notice. Senator Wong, final supplementary question. Order. Why was it appropriate for Minister Taylor to meet with an officer from the unit examining the alleged illegal land clearing by Jamland Proprietary Limited, a company in which he has a financial interest? And why was it appropriate for Minister Frydenberg's office to arrange the meeting? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, I again point out to the Senate that in relation to earlier media queries on this matter, my understanding is that assurances were given only representations in relation to general matters affecting uh, the electorate uh, were made. Uh, if there are any specifics to be added to that, uh, then I will bring those matters back to the chamber. Order. Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Resources and Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Minister, affordable energy is vital to jobs and prosperity in my home state of Queensland. Could the minister update the Senate on any recent developments to lower power prices in North Queensland? The Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I thank Senator Macdonald for her question and you know, her passion about supporting the development of North Queensland. And to develop any part of the country, you need to have reliable and affordable energy. And as I know Senator Macdonald would know well, uh, in North Queensland there is not uh, a reliable baseload form of power supply. The last northernmost uh, 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 power station of that kind is west of where I live, in Rockhampton, and where Susan lives up in Townsville. There's nothing uh, in between and indeed further north of Townsville either. So it's very exciting uh, that the government could announce, uh, Mr President, a couple of weeks ago that the Northern Australian Infrastructure Facility had approved a loan of $610 million to a proposed power station to be built at an old gold mine. Genex Power's Kidston pumped hydro project would provide 
reliable and affordable power for North Queenslanders, to protect, protect jobs in North Queensland, to help families in North Queensland, to bring down electricity prices in North Queensland too, and indeed have benefits across Queensland given that electricity prices are average for households across the state. The project itself would also, of course, have a lot of direct benefits—510 people expected to be employed in its construction and, on, in an ongoing fashion, 30 full-time jobs overall. Deloitte estimates that it will provide $235 million economic benefit to the Queensland economy, and uh, part of those benefits include electricity price savings of around $500 million from this project alone. They see these investments and other investments the government, the government is making are directly helping to bring down power prices. Because the way we bring down power prices is to invest in more power supply. We have more power supply. That will help take the pressure off power prices. That's why we support all types of power generation. That's why we support the ambition of North Queenslanders to have the same types of reliable power supply that the rest of the country has. And that's why this investment from the NAIF is such a game changer for North Queensland. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. What can governments do to ensure investment in new baseload power sources in Queensland? <coughs> Senator Canavan. Well, Mr. President, uh, I thank again uh, Senator Macdonald for that supplementary question. As I alluded to, the government is supporting all types of uh, in energy investment as well across the country. And, and, and the, the Gen X power station is a very exciting project, but the, uh, the government is also supporting a proposed uh, high efficiency, low emission coal fired power station at Collinsville in North Queensland as well. A great project, a fantastic project that is being proposed by uh, a company called Shine Energy, owned and operated by traditional owners, owned and operated by Indigenous Australians, by Ashley Dodd, who's the managing director. He's a, uh, a person of the Beery Nation. And he and his people want power supplies just like the rest of the country. So guess what? Our first Australians want reliable and affordable power to provide jobs for themselves just as much as we have access to it in other parts of the country. So I applaud uh, Ashley Dodd and the Beery Nation for bringing this proposal forward. The government is supporting it through funding a business case, and I wish them all the best in the development of their great proposal. Senator Macdonald, the final supplementary question. What would be the consequences of failing to take action to bring down power prices and secure reliable baseload power for all Australians? Senator Canavan. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Um, well, look, Mr. President, I think we don't have to look too far, Mr. President, to see the consequences in this chamber itself. We just have to look over there, over there in the other corner of this chamber. Exactly what happened if you oppose power supplies? Because over there, Mr. President, we have a mob, a mob of Greens there who are opposed to coal, they're opposed to gas, they're opposed to nuclear, they're opposed to now wind farms as well, Mr. President. I don't know how we're going to generate power in the country with, with, with the, if these guys ever had the levers of power, right? They're opposed to all types of power supply, basically, in this country, right? Maybe they support solar, right? And they'll find a reason to oppose solar as well at some point. So we'll have no one to turn the lights off. Last one to leave, Mr. President, would turn the lights off if the Greens are ever in charge, Mr. President. They would be the consequence, Mr. President, if we oppose forms of power investment. I forgot hydro. They're against hydro too. They're against dams. Where are you going? They're against dams. They're against everything. Mr. President, but um, if we didn't support power supplies, we wouldn't have power. We'd have high power prices and no jobs. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. Order. My question is to the minister representing the Home Affairs Minister, Senator Reynolds. The Department of Home Affairs has confirmed that from 1 July 2014 to 31 January 2019, and I quote, 81,596 protection visa applications were lodged by persons who entered Australia lawfully by air. 90% of these airplane people have found not to be refugees. In that same period, we have seen bridging visas blow out from 94,000 to almost 230,000. That's an increase of over 140%. Why has the minister allowed for the large blowout in bridging visas and airplane people under his watch? Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Senator Keneally, for that question. I'm not quite sure who airport airplane people are, but I'm presuming you're talking about air arrivals. Um, order. But perhaps order, Senator Senator Reynolds. I have Senator Keneally on a point of order. Senator Keneally. Uh, the, minister, the minister said she didn't know who airplane people were, uh, as I quote from the Department of Home Affairs, there are 81,596 protection visa Senator, applications Senator, Senator Keneally, who were lodged Senator by persons Keneally, who Senator entered Keneally, Australia lawfully this is, by air. Please resume your seat. I grant some freedom for people to draw attention to relevance, but 10 seconds in, it's not an opportunity to reread the question. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, 
the opposition on this are a complete joke. And here's the issue on this issue of our arrivals. When people arrive illegally by boat, they rarely have identification documents. We have no information on them, and that means an extended protection claim and legal process. In addition, these people also risk their life on a perilous journey. However, in contrast, when people arrive by aeroplane, we have their passports as well as any other relevant travel documentation. We know who that person is, and that allows us to take a quick consideration of their protection claim. In addition, a plane flight is considerably safer than a boat journey. So here are the, here are the facts which those opposite either ignore or don't choose to look at. Between 2014 and 15 and 2017 18, 64,362 people arrived via air and subsequently applied for protection. In the same four-year period, 7,615 people were granted a protection visa. This is a refusal rate of approximately 90 per cent. Those who are rejected are expected to return to their country of origin. So you might be trying to get some uh, easy press on this, but the reality is we have a growing number of international students, of tourists coming to our country, and that is a great thing. We want all of those numbers to increase. As numbers increase, of course you will get an increase in all sorts of categories of people arriving, making claims to stay. And so you would expect that number to grow merely by the fact of the amount of people who come here by air. But the government is taking appropriate steps to deal with this, including through the use of airport liaison officers in Dubai, in major hub ports, so that we can offload people where we know there is a threat. Senator Cornelius, Thank the Minister question. for repeating the fact I put in my question back to me in her answer. The new Assistant Minister for Customs, Community Safety and Multicultural Affairs, Jason Wood. Order. Senator Keneally, please continue. May I get my time back, please? I will grant some. There were interjections on both sides. I will grant some discretion. Senator Keneally. The new Assistant Minister for Customs, Community Safety and Multicultural Affairs, Jason Wood, remarked on the blowout of airplane arrivals and said, organized crime and illegitimate labor hire companies are using this loophole. Minister, is this true? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And I'm somewhat bemused that uh, Senator Keneally would ask a question that she clearly thought she already knew the answer to. But let me provide you some more facts about air arrivals. Uh, if, if the information I provided you wasn't enough, let me provide some more facts. Between the 1st of January and the 31st of May this year, there are, is a 32 per cent decrease in protection visa applications lodged by Malaysians compared to the same period in 2018. Between 1 January and 31 May 2019, there was a 20 per cent decrease in the number of protection visa applications lodged across all nationalities. These order. declining Senator figures Reynolds, are Senator noteworthy. Wong on a point of order. Thank you. A uh, point of order is direct relevance. Um, the minister is talking about protection visas. The question is actually about Mr. Wood's comments that organised crime and illeg illegitimate labour hire companies are using the loophole. We'd ask you to ask Thank her you, or to remind her of the Due question. Due to noise around the chamber, I appreciate being reminded of the question because I had trouble hearing it. Uh, the minister may have had trouble hearing it as well. Um, she has 22 seconds remaining to answer. Senator Reynolds. Uh, Mr President, I was being directly relevant because I'm talking about the reason for the increased numbers and what we are doing to decrease the numbers of people we do not want to come into this country. So what the information I said is directly relevant. You might not like the fact. But it was directly relevant, and my answer stands, Mr. President. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. The Migration Institute of Australia said, and I quote, people smugglers in Malaysia have got a whole industry set up. Why has the minister allowed criminals to set up a new people smuggling industry at Australian airports on his watch? Is he just lazy or incompetent? Senator Reynolds. Huh. Uh, Senator Keneally, I think it is the height of cheek and hubris to talk about illegal arrivals to this country, because, as everybody in this chamber knows, that it was those opposite who opened our borders and let 50,000 people, let people smuggling rings right across our region bring 50,000 people into our country. It was you who opened all of the detention centres, offshore and onshore, and it was under your government, when last in government, 1,200 people died at the hands of people smugglers. So I've got to say it is the height of cheek and hubris 
and deception to try and draw that bow to this side of the government because we are extremely proud of our record of fixing up your mess and stopping the death that you caused. Senator Cormann. I ask that further questions be placed in a notice paper. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Colbeck to the question that I asked in relation to the Earlhaven nursing home. Well, we've had another pretty poor ordinary performance today in question time from the Minister for Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. I think yesterday his performance on these important questions could be best described as bumbling, and we've moved on today to hopelessly deluded. I mean, yesterday, Senator Colbeck was unable to answer the most basic questions about this terrible incident at the Earl Haven nursing home, where about 70 elderly residents were, had to be evacuated uh, to other aged care facilities. Uh, and today, uh, he has come back into the parliament earlier today to answer the questions he was unable to answer yesterday revealed that, in fact, the situation at Earlhaven was even worse than what we all realised, and then had the hide in question time to argue that all of these sanctions issued against Earlhaven amounted to corrective action, that that was the system working, protecting older people. Things were all OK, despite sanction after sanction being issued against the operators of this nursing home, a company called PeopleCare. So, what we've learned today from the questions that Senator Colbeck has now answered is that, in fact, in the years leading up to the evacuation of residents, uh, there were at least seven sanctions issued by Senator Colbeck's own agencies against people care for their inability to run the nursing home properly or in line with legislative standards. And in addition to those sanctions, there have been 22 complaints made about uh, people care since the 1st of January 2018, a bit over a year ago. And these sanctions that were issued by Senator Colbeck's own agency against people care, they're not for small matters. They're not for you know the lawns not being mowed properly or you know, there might be a lick of paint needed on some of the buildings or the gates or anything like that. That is very serious matters. The, the seven sanctions that have been previously issued against people care by Senator Colbeck's own agencies are for things like failing to provide elderly residents with a safe environment. I mean, does it get more basic than that? This, this, this operator was unable to provide a safe environment to elderly residents. Uh, Senator Colbeck's agency knew about that and issued sanctions against them, but they've continued operating. They were also judged to have not provided adequate nutrition and hydration to elderly residents in the time leading up to the uh, incident a bit over a week ago. And they've also been sanctioned for not providing the required financial reports. Now, we know the limited facts that we have already indicate that there's been some sort of a financial dispute and someone either was unwilling to pay the staff and the operators or someone didn't have the money to do so. I would have thought that not lodging financial statements might also be a bit of a sign that things aren't really working out. And as I say, in addition to that, there have been 22 complaints made about people care in a bit over a year leading up to the evacuation of residents just over a week ago. And rather than coming in here and saying that this was disturbing, that it does appear that there's been a failure of the system and that the regulators have failed to do their job and have let down these elderly residents, their family members and staff at this nursing home, instead, Senator Colbeck says that that amounts to corrective action, as if everything is fine. I, I, would, I would have thought that corrective action means actually doing something to fix this or to stop this operator from continuing to not provide adequate nutrition and hydration to residents, 
It might amount to stopping them from failing to provide a safe environment. That's what corrective action looks like, rather than handing out a sanction uh, one year, letting things roll on, handing out a sanction another year, and this, this series of events accumulating and getting to a point where a nursing home has to be evacuated and emergency relief found to look after these elderly, vulnerable people. So I, I can't say that I'm satisfied with what Senator Colbeck has had to say so far at all. It, it suggests that he doesn't take this seriously uh, in the way that many people on the Gold Coast do, and I think many people around the country who are concerned about aged care. He needs to do a much better job uh, in answering questions that Gold Coasters have about this incident in future. Your time has expired, Senator Watt. Senator Canavan. Uh, well, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I, I do um, uh, welcome the questions that Senator Watt has um, put on record these last two days. This is an extremely serious matter, and, and you know, I applaud him for bringing it forward. And, and it should definitely be subject to the appropriate scrutiny uh, here in this chamber. And it, it's, it's nice to see that, that question time is used to uh, to investigate what are very important, weighty matters, and matters that have clearly affect, affected uh, individuals very severely. I am a little uh, critical, though, that at times I think Senator Watt is, 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 is moving into to more of a political mode here. And, in terms of, I think he does himself a disservice when he says the minister's been bumbling and things like that. When really, what we need to focus on here is not um, the minister here involved. But we need to focus on the 71 residents that have been impacted by this, this, um, this, this, uh, this unfortunate set, set of events, and also, of course, uh, learn the lessons and make sure that these sort of things do not happen. Because I, I, while Senator Watt has outlined that, that a number of actions have taken place, I do think it's important to actually have on the record exactly what those were, there was certainly it is not true to say that somehow People Care Proprietary Limited, the proponent here or the operator of this centre, uh, were not subject to scrutiny or action from the Commonwealth Department. Indeed, I believe, from the advice I've got from the Department of Health as well in Queensland, um, those included so so the sanctions included ones as recently as the 13th of July this year, the 11th of May 2017, 3rd of June 2016, and going back to going back to the 30th of April 2007. Well, again here, I, I take that interjection, Senator Watt, um, because the other consequence or the logical consequence of some of what you seem to be suggesting is that any time there is a sanction, there should be, the centre should be shut down. A centre should be shut down. Well, we've got four sanctions, Senator Watt, over a period extending 12 years. Um, I, I don't have in front of me exactly what those sanctions were or are. But I don't think I don't think the logical consequence of any oh, I've just got four down here that's written down, but I'll take you that that it might be seven. But I don't think the logical consequence that you seem to be suggesting is any time there's some kind of sanction, we shut down the facility. Because obviously that would have a very big impact. What we need to have is appropriate regulatory action depending on the severity of any any breach. Uh, that is good regulatory practice. So what is the right thing to do here, given this event occurred, is for the government to respond. Uh, expeditiously to help those uh, impacted, and uh, that has occurred uh, with both the Commonwealth governments and the Department of Health in Queensland acting quickly to ensure that a level of care is provided to those impacted. That included the appointment of two nurse advisors. We mobilised the Department of Staff nationally to assist. There is the establishment of a, an emergency hotline, and we're undertaking now an assessment. The second, the next. The most important thing to do after this, after that initial care is provided, is to make sure that, we, that anything that has, has been uh, not done correctly by the department or the, the, the regulatory authority here is uh, properly investigated into. And that's why I do welcome these questions. And uh, the government has already announced a full inquiry to be led by Kate Carnell, Carnell into the circumstances leading up to this, uh, the collapse of this facility. Make sure we understood, understand why it happened, and if there are any. Uh, um, uh, things that have gone wrong here, that appropriate action is taken and, of course, that we put in place measures to ensure it does not happen again. Uh, that is what the government is focused on doing now. The, the government overall here in this space is taking uh, the issue of aged care incredibly seriously. It has been a strong focus of the Liberal National Government uh, for the past few years, but I must say it has been a particular focus for the new the Prime, Minister, uh, Prime Minister Morrison. Uh, in his term, it was one of the first decisions he made as Prime Minister to establish a Royal Commission into aged care uh, facilities and aged care services. Uh, we are increasing funding, even before the findings of that Commission, funding for the aged care sector. 
by $7 billion over five years. It will make sure we deliver more home care places and develop the skills uh, that are needed in the workforce to provide a safe environment and a quality uh, service uh, to our older Australians. Um, uh, this is the biggest, this is a much bigger uh, um, additional funding than, than previous governments, and it is right and proper that we make these decisions, particularly given our ageing population and the clear requirement that we treat uh, the older uh, people in our society with the, the kind of respect and care that they deserve. Uh, we are uh, ne never going to get everything to be perfect, but um, the most important thing here is that we provide that assistance to people impacted and we uh, ensure that, uh, as a government, we do things better uh, every day and provide a better service to our old Australians over time. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Billick. Thank you. Um, I have two rise to take note in regard to the questions that Senator Watt asked to Senator Colbeck, uh, the Minister for um, Ageing. And I agree with Senator Canavan that we need to take care of our elderly Australians. We need to respect them, and we, but we need to make sure that they're living in a safe environment. And this government is in its third term. You are in your third term. You cannot pretend that these things just happened yesterday. You guys need to step up to the mark and actually make sure that aged care facilities are run in the way that they should be. Seven sanctions, as um, Senator Watt mentioned, for basic issues, not supplying a caring environment or a safe environment, about a sanction about nutrition and hydration. Now, I don't know how many aged care facilities people on that side have been in, but I've been in quite a few over my lifetime. In fact, for two years I worked in an aged care facility when I was a student nurse to, um, to subsidise my um, student nurse income. So I've seen it firsthand, and that was some time ago. I will admit that was a number of decades ago. Thank you, Senator Watt. I'll, uh, I'll remember you with that kind term. It was a number of decades ago, but I think I think things have got worse because um, we've got waiting lists as long as your arm for um, people going on to um, home care packages. We've got a government that doesn't take this issue seriously. Senator Canavan said you do. You're in your third term. All you do on that side is blame Labor for things. Well, honestly, there comes a time when you've got to draw a line in the sand and you've got to take some responsibility for being the government. And I'm calling on uh, Senator Colbeck to do that. Senator Colbeck was talking before um, when he was answering the questions, and I've got to say he left me feeling quite concerned because I didn't feel his answers not only were they suitable for this chamber, for other senators, but I didn't think they were really acceptable to the general community and certainly not to our ageing Australians. In the minister's home state, and we both come from that beautiful state down south of Tasmania, there's a total of 2,142 Tasmanians just waiting for a home care package. <laughs> Um, and they haven't even been offered lower packages to what they're entitled to. And this includes 63 Tasmanians awaiting a level one package, 665 awaiting a level two package, 918 awaiting a level three package, and 496 awaiting a le level four package. This is not good enough. The Earlhaven issue is, um, I think, a sign of what We'll, we'll possibly, sadly, I think, probably see more of, and I think that is um, horrifying, and it should be horrifying to all of us. It was distressing for the clients, it's distressing for the staff, and of course there's issues around whether the staff are going to get their um, due entitlements. And I know that um, staff up there are very concerned, in fact, of, about what's happened to the clients as well. So. There's this whole thing about what do we come into politics for? What do we come into politics for? And people say, I come into politics to leave a better society for the next generation, a better community for the next generation. And I'm certainly one of those people that have said that on numerous occasions. But also, I come in because I care about the vulnerability of all Australians, especially our elderly, 
who often don't have family that they can um, that can advocate for them. Uh, and I'm wondering how much advocation had actually happened for people in Earl Haven um, and, and other areas around the state. We need to make sure that as a as a government and as a parliament, we care about these older Australians. Lacklustre answers by the um, minister are not good enough. There's a crisis in aged care. On this side, we have been pushing and pushing for changes in the aged care area for a number of years. In fact, Julie Collins, the member for Franklin, um, for whom I'm the duty senator as the shadow minister for aged caring, has has talked for years about what needs to happen. And we're banging our head against a brick wall, but you know what? It's up to you guys. You guys are in your third term. You need to thank sharpen you, your Senator pencils Billick. and get your on time with the has job. Expired. Senator Brockman. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, I will add my voice to that of Senator, um, <coughs> Senator Canavan in stating how serious this issue is taken by the government. Um, the, the welfare of older Australians is of utmost importance to this government, and the characterisations by those opposite of the minister's response is—and I'll put this mildly rather than uh, strongly—but it is, is grossly unfair. Uh, I have, have spoken to Minister Colbeck about this issue, and I know he cares absolutely very deeply about it. Uh, those opposite need to be very careful that they don't seek to politicise this issue in this way. Uh, they know that the sanctions they know that the sanctions imposed on the facilities concerned were not the cause of the evacuation. That was following a contractual dispute, uh, and Senator Watt in particular knows this because, in paying tribute to everyone involved. He stated on Hansart, I'm sure that when those people turned up to work that day, they weren't expecting that they were going to be part of some mass evacuation exercise. And that's true. And if staff on the absolute front line of this very sad situation weren't expecting it, how was anyone else? The sanctions, as you very well know, Senator Watt, were not related. Now, this government and this minister have taken swift action. This minister has instituted an independent inquiry which will look at everyone, including the department, and to uh, learn what we can and learn how we can operate better into the future. And obviously, the Aged Care Royal Commission will also be a very important part of informing where policy in this area goes. But this is a government with a very, very strong track record in supporting older Australians, particularly older Australians in aged care. Um, the Morrison government is increasing funding in aged care by $7 billion over the period 2017-18 uh, to 2022-23. That will deliver more home care places, keeping people in their own homes for as long as possible. It's about in continuing to develop a skilled workforce so that those who are looking after our older Australians have the skills they need to do so in a safe and effective and efficient manner. Uh, we also obviously are looking at improving the systems to provide safe and quality home care and residential care. Uh, this is an ongoing process. There was the More Choices for a Longer Life package in the 2018-19 budget and uh, the choices for a longer life in the mid-year economic and financial outlook. Uh, in 2013, when Labor was last in office, funding for aged care was $13 billion, or just over $13 billion. Uh, today, that's at around $21.7 billion uh, in the next financial year, and that grows to 20, over $25 billion by 2023. Now, uh, well, according to reporting in the Sydney Morning Herald, I don't know how, 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 how much credence we should place in that, but according to reporting in Labor's election costings, there was no additional funding for residential or home care aged places. 
So we have a situation where we have a government that is responding to the needs in the sector. We understand that older Australians are vitally concerned about their future, how long they can live within their own homes, what they're going to do after that is no longer possible. The 1920 budget allows 10,000 additional home care packages to be released across all levels. That's at a cost of $282 million to the budget. Um, this was announced in February of this year, and that recognises the increasing demand for home care packages. Uh, people do want to stay in their own home as long as they possibly can. Uh, in March 2019, the government announced the largest ever expansion of residential aged care in Australia's history, with 13,500 new places uh, at a cost of around $907 million a year, uh, plus $60 million in capital grants to grow residential aged care services. There are issues in this industry, but this is a government that's delivering. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, it's important, just listening to uh, the comments here in the chamber, that this Senate uh, understands that more than 129,000 older Australians are languishing, waiting for care. The answers to the questions today focus not on the immediate movement that should have occurred, but also the immediate movement that should occur still across the country in terms of the care of our seniors. In the Northern Territory, there are 34 people in the Royal Darwin Hospital alone who should be in aged care. The lack of home care packages and funded aged care beds is impacting on our public hospital system, with bed shortages and overcrowding. I certainly want to see the current minister go to the Northern Territory to see for himself how older Territorians die waiting for packages and appropriate care. I'd certainly like to see him out in our remote communities, the remote regions of the Northern Territory, where there is an acute shortage of aged care services, so that he can get a clear understanding of where this government is failing. He needs to talk to the Indigenous elders. They want to live out their lives caring and being cared for on country, passing on songs, their good yiga, their map, their songline, and their stories to the younger generation. But they can't <coughs> because there are no aged care facilities in some of these communities. I'd certainly like to see this government properly fund our aged care services so the unacceptable wait list for home care packages is reduced so people don't die waiting. And in the Northern Territory, the Council on the Ageing has long called for a good look into the aged care licensing system and how it is operating there. COTA NT, who do a fantastic job advocating for older Territorians want to see the appointment of an aged care quality safety commissioner who could do spot checks on service providers to ensure people are getting the, service, the services and the packages they qualify for. And such a position could go a long way to making sure the situation at Earl Haven in Queensland isn't replicated anywhere else in Australia and in particular in the Northern Territory. 16,000 Australians died in, in a year waiting for a home care package that meets their needs. And National Seniors Australia have been very clear about the impact of the chronic shortage of home care packages across the country. They've described this government's neglect of seniors as a form of elder abuse and a national emergency. National Seniors Australia's Chief Advocate Ian Henschel called for urgent action again this week. And as this government has shown today by their responses to the very valid questions raised by my colleagues, there is a disrespectful lack of urgency to create change and ensure vulnerable Australians are well looked after. Yes, there is a Royal Commission underway. 
but that, that cannot be used in his excuse, as an excuse not to act immediately on the day-to-day -day issues that are impacting this country. We shouldn't have to remind this government that at the end of 2017, the waiting list for home care packages was 104,000. When the Royal Commission opened in January this year, it was 128,000 and described as cruel, unfair, disrespectful and discri discriminatory by the council assisting the commission. And six months on, the wait list has blown out by more than another 1,000 older Australians. They know that 1,000 Australians turn 80 each week. And these are our loved ones, people at a fragile stage of life who want to remain in their home under the supported care of their families. Yet this government refuses to prioritise the care of our elders and they take their eyes off the ball and even those who do receive packages can end up on the street. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Watt to take note of answers from Senator Colbeck be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Uh, thanks, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer given by uh, Senator Birmingham to my question. And I asked about the really powerful uh, position statement that the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, the government's own authority, had issued last week begging for urgent acceleration of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, not just this focus on resilience, which the government likes to trumpet quite frequently. Of course we need to do resilience work, but here is the Reef Authority calling and begging the government for action on climate change to reduce emissions to give the reef any chance of survival. Now, I put that to the minister and asked him, would, would the government genuinely listen to this advice from their own body, from this own expert scientific body? And I, I'm afraid I didn't really get an answer. And I had included a quip about would they just cut funding for Gabumpa instead of listening. But I'm afraid the government's got form in this regard. The Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority has been subject to those efficiency dividends that every other department has also been subject to. They have had cuts to their funding. And not only that, we saw that a rival private charitable organisation got almost half a billion dollars of funding to allegedly protect the reef, rather than that money going where it naturally belongs to the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. So I didn't think my uh, assertions were unfair, but of course it gave the minister a lovely premise to ignore the bulk of my question entirely. What he then tried to assert was that actually Australia can't really do much to protect the reef anyway. We're just one nation amongst many. Well, do we run that argument when we're talking about our chances of Olympic gold? No, of course not. We talk ourselves up when it suits us, and this government talks down our ability to show leadership when it matters, when it's inconvenient for them, and when it shows up their absolute obsession with new coal, thanks to the many millions of dollars that they receive in donations from the coal and gas companies every year to fund their own re-election campaigns. Now, the minister then ran that old trope that the government likes to trot, up, trot out that will meet our emissions reduction targets, so therefore everything's fine. Well, the scientists have been saying for many years now that those targets are inadequate. They will not save us from extreme weather events, nor will they save the reef from losing more of the coral cover that it's already lost 50 per cent of in those two successive bleaching episodes in 2016 and 17. And that is exactly what the Marine Park Authority was drawing your attention to by saying that we need this urgent action to accelerate greenhouse gas reductions. It is saying that your existing climate policy is not good enough to save the reef. I don't know what about that advice is unclear, and I know you've got a tin ear to science, and I know it's blocked by the dollars that flow in from the coal mining companies, but what more can the scientists do to try to beg for action? They are doing their utmost, your own people, independent scientists. There is not a lack of scientific consensus here. We all know what needs to be done to save reefs globally, including our beautiful Great Barrier Reef, which supports 67,000 people in work. Now, you love to crow about how the best form of welfare is a job. Well, what are you going to say to those people whose, whose very product is being damaged thanks to the policies and the lack of action by your government? 
The minister didn't really have a very good answer to that at all. And instead, he then blamed the Australian Greens and said, we're the threat to the reef, as if us reflecting the scientific concern and begging for action is somehow the problem. That's somehow what's wrecking the reef. No, it is greenhouse gas emissions that is wrecking the reef, and it is your government's continued useless policies to tackle climate change that is wrecking the reef. So I thought it was just a little bit rich to turn the finger on our party and blame us for the death of the reef. We have been here working for many years in concert with the scientists, try to get some action out of you and your government, and we will not stop doing that because we care for the 67,000 people who rely on the reef. We care for that $6 billion that's propping up our economy. And we care for the amazing biodiversity that is in that reef. It is not for us to destroy the seventh wonder of the world. We do not have that right. And just because you get a few million bucks from coal companies that then write your own climate policies, what a cheap date you really are. And you are selling out the reef. So I'm afraid I got no decent answers to my reef question. Even when I cited Sir David Attenborough's call um, and his description of Australia's climate policy and our failure to act as extraordinary, if you won't even listen to your own agency, if you won't listen to the likes of Sir David Attenborough, if you've got a tin ear to the marine park operators who have finally spoken out and they've been very worried for a long time, but they're worried for their product and they haven't spoken out, they've had the guts to do so now and you're still ignoring them, I don't know what's going to get through to you, but we're not going to stop trying. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary no, the ayes have it.